Welcome to Live from My Drum Room. It's a pleasure to see you all today. And um, it's a real pleasure to welcome a friend for many years and truly a legend, the one and only Omar Hakim. Live from his studio. Yeah. Hey, man. Oh, man. So good to see you. Thank you for being here today, Omar. Appreciate it. Oh, great to see you too, man. It's been too long. I know. I know. Yeah. Wow. I don't even know where to start. I, you know, I, I was looking, you know, thinking about doing this and started to look at all the amazing work you've done through the years. And, and uh, it's probably easier to mention, talk about the bands you haven't played with, you know, <laughs> like maybe on one hand, I could, I don't know. I don't think you recorded with the Beatles or Led Zeppelin no. or no, but you've no. probably recorded with Paul McCartney, maybe. Possibly. Well, I actually I actually just did some playing with him that was kind of fun. Um, okay. Yep. <laughs> at the Taylor Hawkins uh tribute uh shows. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And I, I I made a note about that. And we I, I do want to get get to that and talk about that oh. too. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. That's and I, let me just ask you, since you mentioned that, were you and Taylor pretty tight did you did you guys get pretty tight over the years or well we weren't super tight only because i i i don't live in los angeles but whenever they would come to the east coast uh i would always hang out with them uh dave and i uh stayed in touch uh from the moment we met and and how that happened was around the time of um the wasting light record rachel and i had just come home from a tour and that was definitely a record that we were kind of rocking on the road on the tour bus or whatever. And so when we got home, she says, you know, Omar, the Foos are playing at Madison Square Garden. You should go or we should go. So I, so I checked for the tickets and I didn't I saw that the tickets were sold out. Mm. So then I was like, well, dang, OK, how, how do I how do I do this? And then I thought to myself, oh, well, Dave and Taylor play Zildjian Cymbals. And do you remember? I actually called you. Oh, no kidding! And yeah. you were the one that connected me, connected me with with uh, with those guys. And and you you said to me, you said, "Oh, they'll get back to you. They always get back. They're going to get back to you in, within the week." And I was like, "Wow, that would be great." This, this you know, we've got about a week before the show. And you hit send on that email, and three hours later, Taylor wrote back. In three <laughs> hours, I was shocked. He goes, "Dude." We know who you are. We love you, man. <laughs> we got you. How many tickets do you need? And he was so cool. Yeah. And yeah. so we we went to we went to Madison Square Garden. The show was banging. Um and um, but it was crowded backstage. And 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 Taylor came out and he said, Dave wants to meet you. The guys want to meet you, but it's kind of a zoo here. We're playing in Newark, New Jersey tomorrow. You should come and because it, it won't be so crazy it'll be yeah. give us a chance to hang out and i was like oh man you know i don't i don't want to bug you i you know you've done so much for us it's really great and then i get an elbow in my ribs for my wife hey. <laughs> and i'm like oh yeah so i'm definitely going <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> always pay attention to the elbow from the wife yeah, yeah the elbow the wife elbow is you know very enlightening <laughs> I, Omar, I, yeah, that's what, a, sorry, continue. Yeah, yeah. No, well, anyway, next night comes. It's a great hang. I meet Dave. I meet the rest of the guys. And we've stayed in touch ever since. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, in fact, I played percussion on their last record on uh, Medicine at Midnight. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's been a long relationship. Not as close as I would have liked to have been, but every time we got together, it was always a fun hang. And, and and at the sessions, um, you know, in between songs, I remember sort of sitting at Taylor's drums and he and I going back and forth about like our favorite yeah. group and our favorite records. And 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 one of the last things I remember playing for him was uh, a couple of beats from uh, the Birds of Fire album by Mahavishnu. Oh, man. <laughs> we, we, were, we were tripping out over uh, celestial terrestrial commuters. I don't know if, if you remember that one on Birds of Fire. But, I, I but know I've heard it. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, totally insane. And, and we, yeah. we had a good laugh, both of us tripping up over that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> you know, he, oh man, I, I, I didn't know him well, but he was such a, a student uh, of the drums, you know? And, oh yeah, man. And, and, and I could totally see that. And I forgot about that. I forgot about, I remember that now. And, and I'm so glad I had something to do with that and that you guys connected because he's the kind of guy that like, you know, he probably was such a huge fan of all your work. Like, he, I, I have to think when you guys connected, he was like, man, I loved you on the Sting record. I loved you. You know what I mean? Like he's. Yeah, well, he did. He did share that with me and he was really yeah. gracious about it. And, you know, again, and and I'm a I'm a huge fan of their work. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, yeah. You know, Taylor was a beast and, and, and a great guy and, and, a, and an incredible spirit for that band. You know, that yeah. that band really took off when he got there. And and not to mention Mr. Grohl himself, who is who is just a beast at the kit, and and a fantastic songwriter and and and, and arranger and and yeah. producer himself. So you know, getting an opportunity to to hang out with them and you know share music, make music, hang, jam. You know that yeah. that was that was cool. And yeah, and I like that part of kind of retaining your fan energy about music you know and what i mean is staying excited about music yeah. you know I, I feel the same way about music as i did when i was 10 years old you know i i hear a record and i and it, it freaks me out and i get excited and i get inspired and you know what i mean and i never yeah. want to lose that that feeling you know what i mean uh, about music and about the excitement of of participating and make you know in the business and making music man absolutely no i i know that about you i know and um, and you know, I, I just, you know, Taylor, just a, another thought on him, you know, I, 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 again, I, I can't say that I knew him really well, but every time I ever spoke with him or, or, you know, emailed a few times after I left Zildjian, we stayed in touch a little bit and he was such an old soul, you know, mm. like he just, for a guy that was, I mean, he, you know, rest his soul, he was only 50 when he passed, but mm. like going back 10 years ago or more when he was in his thirties or maybe just 40, he had this, this great knowledge of, of guys, you know, you're not much older, but, uh, but like the generation before him, he was, oh, yeah. So, yeah, he was so dialed into it. And, and I remember like talking to him at NAMM shows where he'd be so dude, you know, and he'd, he'd talk about like a record that you might be on or that, you know, Roger Taylor, you know, a Queen record or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, he, like, he had a tremendous respect for, you know, the, the history of rock and roll and yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and the guys who who really um, were the, the building blocks of, of the sound and, and, you know, and the, the evolution of, of 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 drums inside of that that genre, you know, yeah. and, and so yeah. and he embodied that at the gigs and he that dude had a lot of energy man i mean the last gig i saw him play with them was a few months before he died actually it was september 2021 uh <clears throat> dave called me and said we're playing in connecticut you got to come to this gig and so i was like well yeah i'm not gonna miss it thanks for letting <laughs> me know i'm totally gonna be there and I woke up that morning not feeling good. I was kind of like out of it. And it was a crappy day. It was like a monsoon rains. I was like, Ooh, Rachel, yes. I don't know if, if I'm going to, if, if I've got the energy to deal with this. And then I got another text from Dave. See you later. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we got a rally. We got, we got a rally. We're going to do this. And I'm glad I, I'm glad I did because we, you know, like I said, the weather was awful, but we drove from New Jersey to, to Connecticut and um, they met us at the backstage door and it was great to see everybody. Still COVID happening. So I had, we had to yeah. take a COVID test to get in. But once we were in, man, it was a fun hang. And, you know, we, we were catching up as usual. And um, and then I walked to the stage uh, with those guys and Rachel and I sat on the side and watched the gig. And when when. Taylor went out front to sing and Dave got on the drums, you know, halfway through the song. I mean, they're jamming away on his the Queen song that he loved. Yeah. He loved. yeah. And it, and so when it stops and it, it kind of breaks down for Dave to do a drum solo, Taylor goes on the mic, where's Omar? And I was like, <laughs> oh, no. All right. It's set up. And so they pulled me on stage and then and, and we and it turned into this really lovely wow. jam. Wow. Um, and so in many ways, the fact that I, I I was I woke up feeling crappy, but I rallied for that basically last time that I saw Taylor play live. I was like, oh, 
man, wow. what a night, what a night. And he was like phenomenal that night. He, it was really happening. So beautiful. What a great story, man. What a great, mm. I, you know, I, I think, um, no, it wouldn't be the last time I saw him, but I, I remember in the nineties, like not long after he got the Foo Fighters gig, it would have been like late nineties, could have been early two thousands. They were opening for the stones mm. and it was either, yeah, it was either in, in New Jersey or it might've been here in Boston, but yeah, I went over, I saw Taylor backstage and, you know, we'd met a few times before that when he was with Alanis Morissette and, yeah. uh, and I went over and said hello to him, like reintroduced myself to him and he was so funny. This is typical. You know, he, he said something like, are you, are you here to see Charlie? And I said, yeah. And he's, he thought that was so cool. Like he was like, he's like, oh, do you know him? And I said, well, I know him a little bit. Yeah. He's like, oh man, that's so cool. You know? And, and I'm thinking, dude, there are so many people out there right now that would love to meet you, you know? Like, exactly. Yeah, I know, but he was, he wouldn't hear any of it. He was like, no, no. man, that's so, you, wow, Charlie. Oh man. He's, you know, I think he said something like, I, I talked to him the other day, you know, he's really cool to me or something, you know? Yeah, of course, man. No, he's he was. Yeah, totally, totally. And yeah, a great yeah. sense, a wicked sense of humor. And, you know, it, yeah. it was always fun hanging with those guys, you know? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, Omar, so we're live and there are so many people watching, but oh. especially some old friends of yours. Okay. Um, some, of your, some of your Berkeley uh, folks, Eggy Castrillo. Yeah. Casey Shirell, Skip Hatton. Yeah, Casey. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Skip, you and Skip were... Our ex weather report drummer. That's so right, weather that. report alumni. Yeah, weather report alum. So man, this is and everybody everybody sends their love and and uh, lots of. Hey questions man, let me tell you people. something, man. That Berkeley crew. First of all, I, I want to send all of those guys a lot of love, man, because I, I wasn't there very long, but while I was there, I had the the loveliest time. Mm. Um, hanging with them, being with them, going to classes, observing their genius yeah. it's a it's a, it's a staff it's a, it's a it's a the percussion faculty is like all geniuses in what they do and and you know i, I remember going to some of those guys like damn i i should enroll in this class <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i know you know they're kicking some some great information but you know and file that under you never stop learning you yeah. never stop learning man and you get around these guys um and and you're going to be inspired and 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 it's a beautiful environment for young drummers and young percussionists uh to participate in and to be a part of it was just a fantastic experience i i just want to send love and hugs oh, to all my, my 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 buddies at, at berkeley man it was an that's, awesome experience. that's beautiful eggy says we love you man uh, yeah i mean i know they're there I, I used to spend a lot of time there when i was working for zildjian i'd go up and sometimes sit in on their departmental meetings and, uh, and you're right. I mean, the staff, the, the, the faculty is like, you know, it's second to none, man. Second it, to none. Yeah. Second to none. It's just really yeah. fantastic. Uh, and what can I say, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and, and just a great, a, you know, a really well-managed run organization school. Oh, know, absolutely, you know, man. Absolutely. Notch. Ron Israel is, is rocking it up there doing this thing and, you know, captain of that ship, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. awesome. You know, that's great. Well, good. I, I just wanted to let you know they're out there and, you know, and, and they're, they're here to see you because they don't often tune in. So great. Thank you. Thank you. All um, right. <laughs> but man. Um, so this is great. And, you know, I, I said this during the introduction, I'm just going to say it's, it's great that you're on this episode because this is like a year anniversary of my Modern Drummer oh. Podcast Association collaboration. So oh, dig that. nice. Yeah. So I'm so glad it could be, you could be here today to be you know, oh the, man, the, the one year, yeah, nice um, man. I, you know, it, I when I saw you at PASIC, whenever November just a few months ago, yeah, uh, you know, seeing you play, Omar, it was like a. It it brought back all these great memories of all different times that I've seen you, whether it's in clinics or or live, and and you're like this, you're like the guy that is always like you said at the beginning, you know, the music you love, you're inspired by music, and you you always. Um, I won't say you change, but you grow with music. You, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like you're, you're like. You're it does make sense. And, 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 and I, and it's something that I try to be conscious of because I am acutely aware that 
I'm still learning and growing and evolving. M you know, music is no different than you, you like doctors. You always hear doctors say they have a practice. You never hear doctors say I have a job or I have, you yeah. know, they, they call it their medical practice. Right. Yeah. Which, so yeah. so yeah. music is the same way. I have a music practice. What does that mean? That means that things are changing. Things are evolving. Technology comes and goes. But I'm still practicing this discipline of being a musician, being a drummer, being a professional participant in the industry. I'm sitting in my recording studio. A lot of people don't know. Now, I've been a, in, a recording engineer for most of my career. Mm. Not just a drummer, but I'm also a composer. I'm a vocalist. I'm, I'm, you know, I play little keyboards. I play a little guitar. Why? Because when being in the business for as long as I have been in the business, you know, you you learn to wear many hats, not only for your for your evolution, but for your survival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Because again, yeah. this is this is uh, how I make my living. So what that means is is that I, I need to pay attention. I need to keep growing. I need to keep that fire and that that love. And, and the funny thing is, I, I would even say that I'm enjoying playing and making music now more than ever. And and that's a might be a weird thing to say. No, it's after you know 54 years in the business, you know, but the truth is I'm not jaded about it. I'm I'm very aware that um, it's a gift and a privilege, and um, and so I approach it as such, man. And and thank God, man. You know, I'm 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 still here. I'm I'm, I'm healthy enough to keep whipping some drums and slinging some wood, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, and making music and and yeah. and sharing, and sharing, yeah, and sharing. Yeah, you, all those things, though. You're right. I mean, you you take great care of yourself physically. I know and. Uh, I remember the first time I, I met you and really got to hang out. I, I think I reminded you of this when I saw you at PASIC. You played at the 80, 1989 PASIC in Nashville. And that was when I had just joined Zilch. And you were there with your with your group because you had just released your first solo record. Oh, that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And, uh, and we went out to a, like a vegan Indian restaurant. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you remember. If we, I think somebody told you about it or we found out about it. And I had just yeah. become a, a vet. I had stopped eating red meat anyway so oh, wow like, yeah and, and you were like man is it cool because i'm you know i'm vegetarian or i'm vegan and i'm like absolutely and you got me out of the the banquet which was like the rubber chicken thing you know that, <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you again 35 years later <laughs> those dang rubber chickens <laughs> <laughs> for bailing me out but we had it was it was it was such a great hang and connection and um, oh i'm um, so i remember I that I, re yeah. I remember uh lenny demuzio sitting in the front Yes. And, yeah, uh, that's right. Because we were there for a little while of it. And then we left. And Lenny was, I think that's, Lenny and Armin were throwing, you know, rolls, salad rolls at the guy giving speech. <laughs> you know, it was like, they're just. It was laughing. like a high school cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, when you mentioned Lenny, I, when you were talking about um, something you said earlier about, oh man, I wish I remember, it was a few minutes ago, you said something about being here you know, for, for the time we have or something. And I, and Lenny mm. had this great saying, he just made me think of Lenny and Lenny, his classic saying was, we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. Oh, yeah. okay. But, I like yeah. that. But it's, it's great. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's, use that. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he, he had a lot of good ones, but, but no, I, I just, I, I was so like, it was, I, I, I admire that about you, Omar. I wish I could be more open, honestly, because, um, I see that about you, that you're, you're just, you're just like a, a, the same person you were, you know, as a teenager, just soaking up all this new music. And, and I think that's really inspiring, inspiring for people to, you know, to watch, to understand that, that you need to be that way to, to do what you do. Oh, there's no question about it, man. You know, it's, you know, it's what, what I've discovered and, and I, we've heard this before, it might be a little cliche, but it's, it's not about the arrival. It's about the journey, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's about really enjoying the journey and, 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 and being a part of the, you know, like I said, the evolution and, 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 the, and the learning that is going to continue. If you keep your mind open though, you got to keep your mind open. 
You know, yeah. you, you you can't get to a place where you like you know it all and you know what you know you don't you feel like you don't need to learn anything else or you know you know I there's no joy in that for me. You know what I mean? For me the the joy is in the process. You know that that that's I try to hold on to that. The joy is in the process. That's great. Of learning, practicing, writing music, listening, discovering. That is is what keeps me going. And 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 that that drives me. And like I said, I'm having I'm still having fun. In fact, I could even say I'm having more fun than ever, man. You know, it, that's it's great. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so but that's and, what I would say to all of our, our friends out there, you know, keep, yeah. stay connected to your joy. Don't let anybody take that from you. Stay connected to the joy. Remember why you started doing this in the first place. That is so important, man. Cause when people are talking crap in your ears and, you know, you know, about your music or whatever, you just stay focused on why you started doing this to begin with. And remember that feeling when you heard your first favorite record or you saw a drum set for the first time or you picked up a guitar for the first time if you stay connected to that wow man that's great wow yeah yep i gotta tell you sorry um i can't let this go by without telling you that tane watts is also in the house Jeff yeah sending love and respect to you brothers oh Big man thanks for your inspiration and help over the years and I, and he is a tremendous inspiration. Jeff Tane yeah. Watts is uh, is a genius. He sure is. And man. He Love always yours. blows my mind when I when I see him play. We love you, man. Yeah. Holy crap, yeah. that dude is. <laughs> I know, I know. I I Serious. met Jeff. I met Jeff and Smitty when they were at Berkeley. When I was working at a, at a music store around the corner oh, in yeah. 1980, and 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 they were going to school at Berkeley and. Yeah, and then you know, they're just old friends, and I, I love them both, man. Yeah. I have great memories of um, hanging with Jeff and Kenny Kirkland in LA. They were doing the Tonight Show, mm. but they'd get off, and there was a club that they would go to after the gig and and play. Uh, I forgot. I, I, I want to say it was in a hotel somewhere. Maybe maybe Jeff will type it in if there's a chat. The name of that hotel that they were playing at. And man, you talk about an adventure. <laughs> you know, they would get in that club and blow off some steam, man. And some of the musical moments that happened. And I miss Kenny Kirkland so much, man, because he was another one that was just phenomenal. He was a phenomenal musician. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to, I'm going to just jump backwards. Um, you've probably talked about this a thousand times in your life and, and other podcasts, but I'd, I'd just be curious to know, oh, sorry, Tane says it was La Balage in West Hollywood? Yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. Okay. Right, exactly. Right. Man, there, some music happened at the Balage. Yeah. It's probably never been the same after they got done with it because it, it was <laughs> it was really beautiful, beautiful moments, man. You know, they, you know, they took I, us all to school. Yeah, I, I don't know that place. I'm Wow. I wonder if it's still there. I hope yeah, it's still I there. Yeah, I wonder too. It was part of a little chain of hotels that had like French names. It was a Le, Le Mondrian, a Balazs. Yeah. It was all these really hip little boutique hotels. But yeah, yeah. that was th those were fun nights, man. I'll bet. I'll bet. Super fun well, nights. Well, I was going to just jump back to kind of when I first became aware of you when you got the gig with Weather Report. Um, 23 years old. And I just, I'm, I'm always fascinated by somebody so young having a gig like that and having the ability to play so maturely at such a young age. You know, I, I think I'm, I'm a year younger than you. And I think I could never, I could have never gotten the gig with Weather Report, but I just, I, you know, your ability to play that gig with the authenticity and the authority, you know, and the confidence that you played it with, it's, it fascinates me. And I think it fascinates everybody and what was can i just ask did you we did you have to audition or did joe or wayne know who you were were you recommended or okay good question so well let, let me talk about where i was at in my life and my career up until that point because we're talking 82 when i got the call yeah 
I started playing pro with my dad. His name was Hassan Hakim, he's a trombone player. And my dad played with people like Duke Ellington and Count Basie. He left home at 16 years old with, with Louis Armstrong's big band. Um, so I grew up in the jazz language, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Even though the kids my age were listening to Motown and James Brown and Sly and Earth, Wind and & Fire and all of that. But I, but at, so simultaneously, I'm getting a diet of, of the jazz language, playing with my dad and hanging out with his friends and some of, of, of who were like people like John Coltrane. I remember going to Train's house as a kid. Um, I remember going to Art Blakey's apartment in Harlem. My dad was friends with all these cats. It was a club in the in Queens, in Jamaica, Queens, called the Club Ruby. They had a they had a Sunday jazz brunch that, and I remember going there. They would, they would do it outside if the weather permitted, and you would see people like Horace Silver and 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 Elvin and, and McCoy, and you know it was part of the jazz circuit. They'd come out to Jamaica Queens to this Club Ruby. Man, I saw Rasan Roland Kirk there. Um, so, on one hand, I'm doing that with my dad. On the other hand, I'm playing with local funk and rock bands, and so I grew up. <clears throat> with this really interesting balance of what, what I was getting from the tradition uh, and the language of jazz from my dad and, and his colleagues, and then what was going on on the radio, everything from the Beatles to, you know, the disco era, mm -hmm. right? And so my young mind was a sponge of all of this music, and, and it was all becoming a part of how I felt and thought and dealt with music. I did my first tour. So that was at 10 years old with my dad. By the time I was 15, I did my first tour of America. Uh, we were, the band, the, the band leader's name was Jay Mason. The band was called the Jay Mason Group. He had, he had a deal with Buddha Records. He was being produced by a producer named Stan Vincent, who produced another famous R&B group called the Five Stair Steps. Oh, of course, Ooh Child. Ooh, Child. Exactly, Ooh Child, oh, things yeah. are gonna get easier. I love that song, right? yeah. Me too, so, so here I am on the road, 15 years old, we're, we're opening for, I, I remember doing East Coast Dates with Albert King and his band, which was, was off the hook. I mean, that's where I, I learned how to play the proper <laughs> shuffle. <laughs> yeah, man. Because yeah. those boys were shuffling it up, boy. It yeah. was awesome. But we were also opening for like Hall and Oates, like the like the new this new band called Hall yeah, and Oates. Right. Okay. And, Early Hall and, and Oates. Yeah. And Sha Na Na, which was like a fifties kind of comedy act. Review. And yeah. Another yeah. Uh, all 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 woman band called Isis. Um, and then there was, uh, and then on the West Coast, we t we did some gigs with Sarita Wright, who was the wife of Stevie Wonder. She was a great songwriter, and we also did uh, gigs with a a, a a band from the Bay Area called Cold Blood. Do you remember Cold Blood? Cold Blood. That sounds really. From did they have okay. a song? Oh, maybe? Dude. I... Yeah, you need to know about Cold Blood. Okay. I would say Cold Blood is a little bit before Tower of Power. Okay. And maybe a couple of the cats from Cold Blood ended up in Tower. So Power. they're they're a horn band, like a funk. They were a horn band, but they had the that funk and that. Oh, they were ridiculous, man. Cold Blood, okay. Yeah. Cold Blood, and in, it's interesting. I, I'm a little thing about Cold Blood. Um, there was a drummer in that band who was ridiculous. His name was Sandy McKee, hmm. and I've been looking for more information on Sandy McKee. Um, Tower of Power came through, and um, you know it was it was uh, it was my opportunity to ask them about Sandy McKee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whatever happened to Sandy McKee? You know, um, but yeah, you need to check out check him out because um, there was a song called shop talk hold on let me let me just do a okay. quick let me do a quick look up might as and, well 
Roy Brown is saying, Cold Blood, love them. Lydia Pence is a great singer. Lydia, exactly. Yeah. Pre TOP. Um, yeah. But I'm going to wow. see if I can find the name of this album. Uh, Man, I got to check these guys out. Because it's really, it's important. Drummers should hear this. Um, yeah. Okay, so. Okay, no, I can't find it. So any, Tower, anyway, Tower comes to town. They played in Brooklyn. Um, so I cornered Garibaldi, right? <laughs> and I was like, man, did you know Sandy McKee? And he goes, yeah, of course, Omar. I knew Sandy McKee. Um, he had mentioned that he had died a few years pe- be- prior to that. And he said, he said what was unusual about Sandy was that he was the only drummer that I ever saw play with the hi-hat underneath the snare drum. Oh, man. Instead of the hi-hat being over the snare, yeah, it was lower than the snare so that he had all the space for the backbeat. And so Garibaldi kind of gave me this picture of like his setup. And, and then I thought about it. I was like, that makes sense because the way the, some of the things that I heard him do, I was like, there's something going on, you know, the way he would grab. So you got to find Shop Talk because okay. there's a drum solo in Shop Talk. And in, my, in Jamaica, Queens, there were a few drummers, you know, who knew, who figured out how to play Shop Talk. There was this yeah. one friend of mine named Howie Great. And Howie Great was the drummer for a band called the Firebolts. They were like, they just scared the crap out of everybody whenever they <laughs> come, right? <laughs> they were ridiculous. <laughs> and, and they would do shop talk. And, and Howie could play the solo. So and then all the little drummers were like, okay, I got to learn how to play shop talk. <laughs> gotta, I'm going to be doing, doing I'm going to be downloading some music when we're done. Yeah. So I don't, man. But anyway, oh, I was talking about touring. So... So, yeah, you know, people like that, you know, um, it, it was really amazing to be that young out on the road doing those things. So by the time I got to Weather Report, I was already 12 years into my career, t- yeah. recording, touring as a teenager. You know, uh, I'd been busy. And when I got when I graduated high school in 77, um, Marcus Miller and I got really busy together. He he went to music and art high school as well. And uh, we started doing a lot of work together after that. Uh, and one of the things we did was uh, Tom Brown's Funkin' for Jamaica album. I think the album was actually called Love Approach, but the hit was uh, Funkin' for Jamaica, New York. Um was that and, your first record, Omar? Or was that your first, like... No, it wasn't record? my first. My first records, well, commercially released was something that I did for that that first guy I worked with, Jay okay. Mason, mm-hmm. on Buddha Records, produced by Stan Vincent. <laughs> he, you know, he took me, he, he liked my drumming and he took me in. He started taking me around to do record dates with him, which blew my mind. And one of the dates was uh, something at Sigma Sound in Philly. So, you know, imagine oh, hearing, you know, t- the sound of Philadelphia, TSOP oh. and all, the, all of those records and then ending up at Sigma Sound at, at 16 years old kind of blew my mind. And ad- around this time, we also did uh, a record. It was like a one hit wonder thing that Stan put together the band. He called the band Harlem River Drive. And we had this number one. R&B song called I Need You, which I recently saw on YouTube. Somebody put it up. I Need You by Harlem River Drive. I was 16 when we made that record. I went to number one on the charts. Wow. And um, and and it's funny because it was an early release on Arista. It was one of, you know, uh, Arista was relatively new at this moment. And uh, Clive Davis gave us money to go back in the studio and do a follow-up which completely eluded us. We could never, we never <laughs> came up with that, with that, uh, with that second single or anything. But what we did, what, what did happen was um, I got a lot of time in the studio and that studio was the Hit Factory in New York City. And the Hit Factory um, had a chief engineer named Ed Sprigg. And Ed Sprigg was something else. And he really liked Harlem River Drive a lot. And he wanted to record the band himself. You know, the chief engineers don't have to do that, right? So he must Mm have really dug us. Uh, So uh, Eddie Germano, the the, uh, owner of the studio, gave us the night shift after a while to keep working on our music. 
uh, Sprig would stay and, and, and work with us. And it was Ed that I would sit with. I, I mean, it's because it's, in a way it's because of him that I'm kind of into yeah. like recording because I'll with bet. him, I learned about aligning tape decks and analog tape and, you know, getting into all of that. And so my, my sort of obsession with studio gear started during those days of recording at the hit factory. Wow. And uh, I had another friend who also is a recording engineer, a guy named Fountain Jones, who is now like an Emmy Award winning technical director at CBS Television. But he, too, was sort of a part of that journey. But anyway, back to the weather report, because I know I'm going in different directions. <laughs> no, this is great, man. Are you kidding? This is great. Yeah. But so by the time I get to weather report, I'm I'm 12 years under my belt of touring, recording. I had just come off the road of, of, for my first Europe tour with Gil Evans Orchestra, Gil okay. Evans Big Band, I should say. Yeah, yep. And it was quite an experience. Um, the band, we, Hi Hiram Bullock was in that band. Pete Levin played keyboards, Tony Levin's brother. Yeah. Hannibal Marvin Peterson on trumpet, Lou Soloff on trumpet, David Sanborn would dip in and out. Did I mention Hiram Bullock already? Yes, yeah. On yeah. guitar, uh, Luico Hopper played bass. When he wasn't on bass, Tom Barney played bass. Um, yeah, it was, it was like, it was an incredible experience. Yeah, man. You know, when we got off the plane in Europe, Gil handed everybody a Eurail pass. And that's, and that's how we traveled around Europe on, with, these, with this Eurail train pass. And Gil was like, okay, when the train pulls in, you got to get your stuff on the train as fast as you can. <laughs> Throw everything on or else the train is going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and they do. <laughs> You're throwing the stuff on the train. Right, time. Get your stuff. <laughs> the time to hard this. Whose suitcase is that? Grab that. You know. <laughs> Talk about being inducted into the whole, you know. Hey. Yeah. Travel. Yeah, man. You know, it was awesome, boring. man. <laughs> and uh, and a and a great way to see Europe. Yeah. And um, so when I get home, um, I get a call. Um. And actually, I was still. I was I was holed up in the basement at my parents' house because I, I figured I'm on tour. It doesn't make any sense for me to get an apartment in New York because if I do, I come home and all my stuff is gonna be gone. So yeah, you know, I was like, all right, I'm a, I'm I'm holed up in the basement. That's my my all my gear was down there. So for the few months out of the year I was home, you know, I would chill there and then until the next tour. So um, I'm 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 out. A call comes in. My mom picks up the phone, takes the message. So. I call in, mom, any messages? She goes, she said, yeah, you know, there's a guy called here uh, from LA. He had a funny name. He, he said, his, it started with a Z and he said something about a weather report. <laughs> that was the message. <laughs> and I'm saying, and then in my, so she's, while she's saying this, I'm putting it together. Okay, because LA. Starts with a Z, says something about weather report, Zavano. I said, Mom, I then I'm like, where's that? Where's the do you have the number? She said, Oh, it's, it's around here, baby. I'll find it. It's around here. So I'm like, Mom, you gotta find that. <laughs> you gotta find that message. So okay, well, she finds it and and I call. Yeah. And sure enough, it's Zavano, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So mm -hmm. word is is that he called. He and Wayne actually called a few people in New York to get a recommendation on, on uh, drummers. And the three people they called were Miles, Gil, who I just come off the road with, and uh, Michael Urbaniak. And lucky for me, all three of those guys said my name. There's a kid wow. in New York, you need to hear him. And so, so I would have to thank those three people for getting me a gig and I didn't have to audition. Basically, Joe, Joe and Wayne were like, okay, you're in. And can you put us in touch with your buddy, Marcus? Cause they wanted me since, cause Marcus and I were like a team, you know, we were doing yeah, stuff with Steve Barn yeah. and this one and that one. So they were like, put us in touch with Marcus. You think Marcus would want to do this with you? And I was like, I'll, I, I'll ask him. Now I knew that Marcus had already started working with Miles. And Marcus and I talked about it and, and, and he was, he was like, no, I'm going to, and I'm doing this thing with miles. I'm good. 
you know, I think he was starting to to get involved more with production with Miles. You know, he saw that coming. And so I uh, at right before the like I got to L.A. to actually meet with them, I was doing gigs with Hugh Masekela, mm -hmm. the African trumpet player and Miriam Makiba. And on bass was this guy from Philadelphia named Victor Bailey. And I was like, you know, I hadn't, I knew Vic because he was friends with Bobby Broom and I used to see him at Music and Art with Poogee Bell. And, but we hadn't really played together. Mm -hmm. And I had been in a, 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 a the band with, with, um, with Hugh on another tour. So when I came home, Hugh had some new cats. Victor was in the band. And, and I noticed when Victor and I played together, we had a fantastic chemistry. Yeah. And I remember jamming at a sound check, and as as Victor and I would start kind of exploring, and and it would get long, people would start leaving the stage, and then it would just be me and Vic just going at it. And then I thought, you know, I should really introduce Vic to Joe and Wayne. Yeah. So I said to Victor, "Dude, what do you think about like auditioning for Weather Report?" And Victor was like, "Oh, are you kidding me? I would love to do that." Blah blah blah. So I told Joe about Vic. Vic said, have him send me a tape. So, you know, back then it was a cassette, right? So Victor sends a cassette out to L.A. Joe loved it. And, and then uh, I got my buddy uh, Jose Rossi to play percussion. Mm -hmm. And Jose, I met Jose uh, in like 75 or 76. He was the percussionist for a, for a group called La Belle. LaBelle was Patti LaBelle's group that had a huge hit called uh, Lady Marmalade. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so I ended up subbing for their drummer. Uh, uh, like, like I said, it was I would have been yeah about 16 years old. And so I met Jose Rossi and we hit it off. So I always remembered that experience of jamming, you know, with this amazing percussionist, Jose. So I pulled in Victor Bailey and Jose Rossi into Weather Report. And then we made a record called Procession. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and actually we, we did, we, we did, uh, Domino Theory right after that. And then after that, Mino Senelu joined the band. Yep. So, yeah, it was, so I was very, so was I ready? I was very ready, uh, because I, like I said, I had already been 12 years into playing, touring, recordings, but I also grew up with this very interesting balance of language, of musical language, if you will. Because on one hand, I had jazz over here, but I had the rock and the funk, the the R and B and the and and the the the, the, the stamina to play, you know, kind of music that required facility, but with the energy that they needed. Because Weather Report, I mean, if you if you hadn't been to a Weather Report gig, they were like. Oh. A loud jazz band. Oh, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Man. Absolutely. No, it, yeah. it was serious. It was like, you know, you had to dig in yeah. with these yep. cats. So, yeah. but at the same time, they, 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 you had to be able to connect the evolution of, of where Joe and Wayne were coming from with where they were at when they formed that band into where they were trying to go with it, mm -hmm. which was the blend of world music and jazz and interesting harmony you know there were and, all kinds of influences there i mean we're talking about two incredible composers god rest the soul of, of wayne shorter that is that has been tough i've been i'm still digesting uh that uh the death of my of of, of my inspiration um wayne was 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 an incredible incredible uh musician artist beacon architect i can go on mm. um i got a chance to spend some time with him uh every time rachel and i would go to la in the last couple of years we would never leave la without going to wayne's house and hanging out with he and carolina and uh you know giving him lots of hugs and smooches and yeah and all that yeah. good stuff and because it, it was you know what i learned in my time uh with Wayne and Joe, uh, it was three tours with three tours and three albums in three years or three and a half years of Weather Report. And then actually, I did another tour with Wayne 
after that with Herbie Hancock and Stanley Clark, like in the early 90s. Mm. Uh, these were beautiful times. Uh, yeah. with, um, we, I kind of remember, I was kind of an early riser, you know, on, on those tours back then. Uh, and and I, I remember Wayne would also be up. So we would we we would have breakfast a lot together. And um and we would we would we would talk about life. We never talk about music in the you know, in the sense that most cats talk about music. You know, Wayne wanted to talk about life and love and living and spirituality and books and movies and you know, family and you know, and it was interesting to 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 spend those mornings with him walking the streets of Italy and just looking in the stores and talking about stuff and so I have a lot of beautiful memories of that and and it's funny because when you spend that much time with a cat um what you get or well, what I got is that it was no different hearing Wayne play his horn and hearing him speak as a as a human being that like I recognized the same process of thought and and emotion, and um, it was it was really interesting because it was almost like yeah he I I know what he's talking I'm listening to him and I'm going I know what he's talking about right now, mm. but he's playing you know what I mean yeah I do absolutely I could feel I him his emotion and you know and it was really beautiful to. It was like, well, well, there's something to aspire to, like that your 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 playing, your expression is so connected to who you are as a person that you can, you know, you don't need words all the time. You can just use notes and breath, yeah. and it's like, whoa, that was heavy. That you have to think somebody that played with so much soul had a huge soul, you know? Yeah, oh, I God. totally know what you mean, Omar. Yeah, man. Yeah. What? But what? What a blessing, right? I mean, to have those memories that you have, you know, I mean, just that's, you can, you can hold those forever and, you know, and the, the great oh, yeah. thing about those kinds of memories is even though guys our age can't remember what we had for lunch yesterday, that you'll never forget that, that's you know, right? right? That mean, is true, man. Yeah. That, that's real. That's real. Yeah. And, you know, and he and Joe, you know, they and Herbie, I mean, you know, they 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 are the cats that took the, the the evolution. Like when you know, to be a kid, to be 10 years old, 12 years old, and hear those guys for the first time, especially coming from what I was doing with my dad. Mm, yeah. And then along comes Herbie, Wayne, Tony, Ron, right? Miles. Yeah. And then fusion. You know, there was a there was a lot of exploration going on and a lot of people want to kind of dismiss that period as not being jazz. But I don't think that's fair because because really it was young people using the instruments of that moment to further their improvisational exploration. So we're still doing it. And in other words, yep. Yep. you you know, the most dangerous thing that we can do is pass a judgment on the on the form that evolution takes. You 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 have to be willing to just go with this. I'm not. You don't need to agree. Yeah. Actually, we don't need you to. <laughs> we don't even need you to agree. <laughs> it's happening with or without you. <laughs> yeah. But go along with it. Yeah. 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 Try it's it's it. happening. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, and 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 so, and and the beauty of that is that. You know, if if you're open, you're good. You will be able to connect those dots. You'll be able to connect those dots. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so and and so so for for critics to leave to actually instead of draw a line, you know, or connect those dots too, that they want to try to put make the dots go over that and then continue. But no, you got to keep the dots going right through that period because yeah. what what Herbie wrote and what Wayne wrote during that period, what Joe wrote. That is just as important as anything that happened between 1940 and 1967, as far as I'm concerned. You know what I mean? It's yep, part yep. of the evolution. So part of the evolution, absolutely. It's part of the evolution, and all of this is important to me, and it it it, it informed 
me because those were kind of like my my uh, formative years. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's great, man. And so, so you stayed. <laughs> you were in Weather Report for about three and a half years. You said, but during yeah. that time, like eighty three, things just really started to take off with session work, or maybe it even started before then. But again, I'm, this is my recollection is getting the call to do David Bowie's let's dance. And was that through Nile Rogers? Like you, had you known Nile for a while at that point? Oh yeah. Nile and yeah. I had been friends. I met Nile when I was like 11 or 12 years old, man. Oh my gosh. Okay. That far. Back. We were, we were attending the, uh, the jazz mobile workshop in Harlem. My dad used to take me there um, because they had free lessons for the kids. Yeah. And yeah. one of the drum teachers, there was Freddie Waits. Wow. Um, but, and then they had a big band for the kids and Nile was in the big band. Uh, and so I remember meeting him back there. Uh, and then Nile and I had a band. You ever go to these amusement parks and then you see these band shell bands? Oh yeah. Like sure. Cover yeah. bands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So me and Nile, we were a cover, we had a cover band at great adventures amusement park in, in New Jersey in like 19, it must've been like 75. And um, the band was called Brown Sugar. It was three girls out front singing. They were like the Supremes. Um, and and we would do covers of whatever the R&B songs of the day were. So the three girls were singing. I was singing from the drums. Nile on guitar. Denzel Miller, incredible keyboard player. And Denzel Miller on keyboards. And this cat named Rick Tell on bass. And um, And that was our summer gig. And and um, so interesting, after his buddy, Niles' buddy, Bernard Edwards would come to the park with him from time to time and hang out. The, the incredible funky yeah. bassist. Um, and he, because they had an after hours gig after the park. I dig, okay. A lot of the band would stay at the park. They gave us like a little motel to stay at. But Niall and Bernard would go to the city and do their like, you know, midnight to 6 a.m. gig. And then he'd come back to the park the next day. Um, so after we finished that summer, Niall and Bernard said to me, Omar, we're going to Paris. And um, we're starting a new band. We're going to Paris. You should come. And I said, oh, wow, that sounds like fun. I really want to go. But I just auditioned to get into music and art high school. And I don't want to be a dropout before I get there. So you guys go ahead and have fun. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you when I get back. And uh, and 18 months later, I hear on the radio, yowza, 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 dance, dance, dance. Their first smash. Oh, man. I'm kind of kicking myself in the halls. <laughs> I should have gone to Paris with these guys. What were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I mean... It's, I'm 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 half joking because I was like, wow, that was amazing, and one of my buddies, a keyboard player, Raymond Jones, was in the group, and Raymond was also from Queens, so I used to hang out with Raymond all the time, mm. and um, and so one day I was in the city around 1979, walking down the street. I hadn't seen Nile in a while. I'm walking. I'm walking like. East, he's walking west. We're passing each other in front of Carnegie Hall. Oh, and man. I go, Nile, Omar. And I'm like, dude, congratulations. Because by this time, he had had a few hits and I hadn't seen him in a while. And I was, and LaFreak was like number one. I mean, it was like an incredible moment. I said, Nile, this is amazing, man. Congratulations. This, wow, this must, this is amazing. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, it's just been a blessing and really incredible. He goes, Omar, next week, he said, I'm going to be a billionaire next week because I'm getting my royalty check for Le Freak for, you know, the big single hit single. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. dude, this is amazing. And it's like when one of your friends yeah. blows up on that level, you know, and you, it's a big deal. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, yeah. And yeah. so we're standing on the street talking. And um, I said, where are you headed, man? And he said, I'm going to Atlantic Studios right now because we're mastering our new single. And I said, dude, can I tag along? He said, yeah, come on. So we kept talking and we're walking. We're walking, you know, Carnegie Hall is like 7th Avenue, 57th Street. And, and Atlantic Studios at the time was at Columbus Circle 
in like 59th or 60th Street or whatever. So I walk over with him and we get in the mastering room. The engineer's name was Dennis King, I think. Great mastering engineer. And I hear this song that they're mastering. And I'm thinking, dang, man, this one is better than the last one. And and so, you know, I'm watching him cut the, because they, they were, he was mastering the vinyl, which was it's a really interesting process to watch. Yeah. And um, and I said to Niall, dude, I, I think this one is better <laughs> than the last one. The record was called Good Times. Yeah. And the rest yeah. of you, and any Chic fan yes. that knows Good yeah. Times, Good Times is like the basis of a bunch of hit records that came out after it. And, you know, I mean, yeah. so many... Yeah bands bit off of the the good times groove you know another one bites the dust yes of course yeah the yeah take on good times you know yeah, yeah. and then then it was kind of like the blueprint for hip-hop and the mcs i mean that record went nuts and i was i was there listening to it being mastered and it just blew my mind that day i was like okay nile is gone so fast forward a little bit he, she, the chic thing kind of winds down. He's become like the producer. Yeah. And I'm on tour with Weather Report. I'm on tour. He he calls me and says, "Hey man, I've got I've got to do a session with 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 Bowie, and uh, Tony and Bernard aren't available for whatever, for whatever reason. Are you going to be around next week?" And I'm just like, "Actually, I'm on my way home." Um, we, we have a gig at the Beacon Theater and then after that I'll be home for like two weeks so perfect timing and so we go in the studio and at the power station and the first song we cut was Let's Dance that was the first wow. that's how we started the session no kidding yeah had you <clears throat> when you so can I ask you when, you when you got to had you not heard the song until you got there you just they had I heard a, I didn't hear anything until I got some there. scratch demo kind of thing and yeah, maybe there were, there might have been a demo, but the demos were more like guitar vocal demos. They weren't really like, yeah. you know, it wasn't like today where, you know, there's a drum loop and a, you know what I mean? There's a song. Yeah. Niall had an idea for a rhythm concept. He started playing his guitar part. Me and the bass player Carmine Rojas started jamming with him. And then and then this thing starts morphing into the the pattern. It's you know? Yeah, yeah very interesting man and and were you basically did you did you know you'd be doing the whole record at that point i i didn't it's such I, i'm just yeah i need technology it's what a kick-ass track man Uh, when you cut that when you cut that track omar was david bowie in the studio was he was he there to like when the rhythm tracks were cut yeah david was really fun because you know david wasn't one of these singers that um wanted to wait for the rhythm track to be done and then he come in and do his vocals david was like set me up a mic right now i'm gonna sing with the guys and that was key because i think what it what it does is it gives the musicians in the studio an opportunity to hear the artist's intent for the song very clearly. Yeah. And and the funny thing about this pattern uh, that uh, Carmine and I came up with, it's not the typical two-bar pop record pattern. It's not even the typical four-bar pattern. It is probably one of the first eight-bar patterns on a pop record. It's actually an eight-bar phrase. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so 
it, it took us a moment once once we figured out the kind of puzzle of it um that that we were able to get it rolling and then and then the the, the challenge after that after you get this eight bar puzzle figured out is to play it continuously yeah to exactly. keep and it, it resolves itself basically it right? resolves itself after eight bar yeah. but you got to keep it you know because again the, the 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 you know the the discipline of grooving is to not is to play the cymbals in the right place play the drum fills in the right place oh, you don't yeah. want to interrupt the motion of the thing and if you do any drum fill needs to move it along it either needs to move it along or it needs to turn the page to the next verse or whatever yeah. is how I always yeah. looked at it. Perfectly explained. And and that explains so much about that song because what might appear to people to be a, you know, a kind of simple groove. It's another one of those classic deceptively not so, I mean, the stick yeah. in what you're playing obviously, but the way you place all the beats it's genius. It's genius. Absolutely, the way that all moves. Um, it, it was it was a it was a fun hang, and and Dave and Niall, they gave us the time. We took the time to really um, create these special uh, elements. Um, I didn't know. I you know Niall hired me for like two or three days in a row. While I was there, I cut. Uh, Let's Dance, Modern Love, China Girl, Ricochet, maybe one or two others. And then I was out of there. And then Tony came in and, and played on, on some tracks too. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a great, great experience. Dave, David asked me to go on the road with him, but I had already been committed to Weather Report. And I didn't want to, I, I mean, you know, the David Bowie thing was, of course, paying a lot more than the Weather Report <laughs> at the time because he was... He was he was a huge oh. rock star, a huge pop star. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. my heart was still a weather report uh, for the music and for the legacy and for the, um, you know, and for what I understood was going to be invest an investment in time, you know, uh, yeah. create from a creative place. You know, it's just that, you know, the way, the way weather report was featuring my drumming wasn't going to be the same as on the David Bowie show. You know, the David Bowie show which was a fabulous show. I went to see the Serious Moonlight tour. It was it was incredible. But but you know, when you have an opportunity to play with Joe and Wayne and you know and yeah. you know and these guys, I was you know I think I'm going to do this a little longer. And and ultimately, I'm, I'm glad about that decision. And it's when when I said no to the tour, I never thought I'd hear from David again after that. But actually, when he got off the road, he called me up and said, "I'm doing another record." I need you to come back to the studio with me. I was surprised to get the call because I thought it was over, but we ended, we went back in the studio. This time, not at Power Station. We worked at um, uh, uh, Le Studio in Montreal, which was the studio of the band Rush. Yes, yeah. And, and we cut uh, the Tonight album, which had the hit Blue Jean. Yes. Uh, there was another track on there called Neighborhood Threat that was kind of fun. And Blue Jean was a minor hit. It wasn't as big as the Let's Dance album, but... It was it was nice to have that that opportunity to get back in the studio with David and, yeah. and have fun with Carlos Alomar and, 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 and the crew. You know? Do you find now, if looking back at that time in your life, um, the fact that you were surprised? I'll bet now, if you think about it, you realize you did the right thing. You know what I mean? You, I have to think maybe David respected that you'd made a commitment to to Joe and Wayne, and you couldn't really. I mean you. They probably would have understood if you said, man, I got this opportunity to go out on the road with David Bowie, but, but you didn't. And I have to think your, you know, your, your playing obviously speaks for itself that David didn't take it personally at all the way you might've thought he would. And he just went, oh, well, timing didn't work out. Well, yeah. I mean, you know? that's exactly what I thought because, you know, any, anybody else would have looked at me and said, David Bowie just offered you <laughs> five times the amount of money, weather report <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like yeah, it's, you know, but but I think I understood something. I said because there are some things that money can't buy, right? There's some yeah. things, that, yeah. you know what I mean. And I think the experience of being with those guys and and what I learned from them musically and how it expanded my drumming, 
and um it's and how it expanded my composition awareness yeah. you know because i remember bringing music to those cats and and it was interesting to have joe and wayne rip apart your composition <laughs> and explore the harmony and like and it, it, it to this day it, like if i write a melody and i'm working on something like an instrumental piece even to this day, I, I start off with like the first set of harmony, but then a couple of days later, I'll go back, I'll leave that melody in place, but then I'll start to play around with other harmonic ideas behind that melody. And I think I learned that that from Joe and Wayne, because those two guys are like the masters. They were yeah. the masters, you know? Um, and so, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so yeah, I mean, that was... I, I think I just understood the importance of of art first, I guess, on a certain level, and yeah. and the experience, and um, and again, that's that's a great example, Omar, of your maturity for being still a young guy, but like having that instinct to go, eh, you know what, this this is this is going to be great for me. This is great for my forming my my musical personality, you know, playing with these guys. And, and absolutely. And what do you know? It's, it turns out you ended up playing on a billion more pop records in your future, which, you know, right, it's true. I mean, it was yeah. weird. And then the next year I ended up with sting. And so, yeah. you know, the so-called payday happened sort yeah. of late later on, but it still happened. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and that, that that vibe that that thing that got created with sting was also really beautiful and really fun and you know um you know we 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 made some good money that year those two years yeah. you know it was, it's a special time when you you get in a project like that that's successful you know that was, and, it, groundbreaking is what I, how i would describe it it really was it was like yeah. sting's first band outside of the police an incredible yeah. record. Yeah. I mean, it was beautiful, really... beautiful experience, man. And playing with my buddies, you know, uh, that first band of Bramford Marcellus and Kenny Kirkland on keyboards, Daryl Jones on bass. Man. Yeah. Sting didn't even play bass on that tour. That's Daryl Jones of the Rolling Stones on bass. What a, what a right? band. Yeah. And Sting on guitar. He's a great guitar player. Right. Yeah. Right. So we, I... and, with, and Dolette McDonald um, and Javis, uh, uh, Janice Pendarvis. The background singers. It was That's a lovely right. band, man. It was just yeah. a beautiful experience. I was just going to jump back for one second and play another David Bowie song from Let's Dance that you mentioned. And this is, to me, <laughs> such a killing drum track. I just, I just got to play it. urgency you know that sort of almost like ahead of the beat on top of the beat kind of feel to it so much energy and these weren't cut to a clip track Omar these are all live in the studio I mean all yeah Skip ahead to a couple of what I call Omar Phil. Toward the end of the page. So syncopated. I played this song in the top 40 man on the radio. It's one of my favorite songs to play.
Man, that's, it's got to feel good to, to know that you've made this kind of a mark in music. You know, I mean, you've played on some, I mean, these are, I, I mean, like a, the tip of the iceberg, obviously, and songs you've played. It's but. funny to hear that again, because it, what, I'm, what I'm reminded of is that it, that groove sounds like we're leaning forward the whole record, like the whole record is like this. Yeah, leaning, yeah. Leaning on the, on the, and it's funny because in order to create that hype, and it's and here's the other thing about a record like that, which is like when you think about the other work that I was doing, like with Weather Report, and it's, it's so different, the playing on that record. That's like most people that had heard me with Weather Report would have never imagined that that's the same guy. Yeah. But because I grew up playing rock and roll as a kid, you know, I was playing as much rock and roll as a kid as I was playing funk and jazz. So that the language of rock, the sound of rock, was in my ears as well. So that's why I was always really comfortable to kind of go wherever musically and 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 the and the uh the decision to not market myself as one type of drummer yeah. was a conscious one because I I never wanted people to say he's a jazz drummer or he's a rock drummer or he's a funk drummer or yeah yeah what I wanted more people to say was He's a worthy collaborator. I I wanted to um, make myself a, a worthy musical collaborator, so that if they called, I would have an opportunity to make a contribution to the music. Now, whether it's jazz or rock or reggae or funk or whatever, I don't care. We'll figure that out. But what's interesting about the rock thing is that. You know, I, I always had to go into the studio and I had to almost reconfigure my drum set to get that sound because, you know, the drum tuning, the cymbals and everything that I would use with Weather Report would be very different from what I need to bring to the studio with me to make a David Bowie record. You know, everything, the way the drums are tuned and and the type of drum heads and the fact that I have to play harder and dig in and get that, get that sound. Whereas yeah. Weather Report, the dynamic range would start here and go there, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But, yeah. But this, but the David Bowie thing needed to be like a freight train, freight train wide open going down the tracks, you know what I mean? And so it's fun to hear that song because I, I'm I reminded. And again, if you notice this, there are a few drum fills here and there, but it's the urgency of that groove, exactly. and exactly. and the fact that it's I'm not I'm kind of playing the same thing all the way through it. You know, symbols in, in 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 that case are like an exclamation point to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I drop a symbol and it's the exclamation point. Bang! Whoa! You yeah. know what I mean? It yeah. moves yeah. it. It creates an exciting burst of something that, you know, that kind of jolts the listener and kind of keeps this thing moving forward. And so, you know, there's a, I think maybe I'm always looking for like the drama in the simplicity. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like to yeah. me, that's what when I'm doing records like that, it's like, where is it? Okay, every ah, oh, it's such a simple. It's just a rock beat. No, it's not a rock beat because if you, it's not just that because if you find that thing that moves it along, that makes it exciting, that that gives it energy. And I always say that grooves. People always talk about well, what is a groove? What is a groove? What does that mean? What I think it is, is the power of repetition, right? I think great. that, yeah. I think that in, in the practice of meditation, you have something called a mantra and in Buddhism or whatever, you know, you pick, pick the, pick the discipline, pick the, the spiritual practice is a mantra. You repeat it. It gets energy. And if you notice these mantras are the same thing over and over again. But as they get repeated, they get energy and they get bigger and bigger and stronger. And so to me, grooves are like that. Mm -hmm. It's like if you take a snowball, you're at the top of a mountain, you take a snowball and you roll it down the mountain. Well, while it's going down the mountain, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's picking up more snow, right? And by the time it gets to the bottom, it's a, a giant <laughs> boulder of snow, right? Yeah. But it started off as a little snowball. Right. Right? right. Yeah. So to me, a groove, the power of the groove is in the repetition. It's in the yeah. discipline. 
You know, so don't don't play a fill. Yeah, yeah. If you if you play something, it has to have a purpose. If it doesn't have any purpose, just don't throw it in there. Make sure did you did you did you did you um, move the verse along? Did you compliment the singer? Did you respond to something the bass player did? Is is this thing whatever you're adding to it? Is it in the motion and the emotion? of the groove of the song and of the intention. Yeah. And that song, I would say, you know, have, I played that, you know, in my, in my younger days. And the, mm. the challenge was always to have that energy that you have with it and to have that, that drive, but not rush the tempo. You know I mean? Anybody, anybody can, especially me can speed up, <laughs> you know, that's easy. It's, it's the way you play it, keeping the time, the groove solid, but having that, that that sense of urgency throughout it is like it, it, again, it's masterful. It really is. No, that's like, why I said. What, even hearing it now, it's I could. It felt like everybody was leaning forward. You were playing that, faster, but, but yeah. everybody was like that. You know that urgency. You know. Yeah, yeah. And it's so right. it's really it, it's a fun thing to hear all many years later. And uh, and the fills that you play, as you said, they're they're they set up the chorus. Like you as you as you finish the verse. You play these great syncopated fills that just, just perfectly complement where David comes back to the chorus, you know, and and it's it's never you know never in the way of the vocal of of like, oh yeah, know, the yeah, at the end of the, of the day, yeah. it's about the story and it's about the singer. Yeah, you know, I mean, as musicians, as session players, you know, I mean, some so many cats are like, where's, where's the chart? Where's this? Can I see the? The music. Sometimes I go and I be. I want to see the lyric sheet, man. What are we talking about here? You know what? What is? What's the intention? You know? Yeah. There's and maybe so many... that's because I'm a songwriter too. But I think about music like that. You know? Yeah. I was going to say there's so many examples. I just want to play one more quick. I had a, a few here, but I know where I'm keeping you a long time. But this this came out not long afterward. Um, one of my favorite songs. I've told you through over the years that we've known each other. I I come back to the song because your playing is so, I'll use the word understated, but yet it's so tasteful and perfect. And it's a great example of, of like, you'd almost think it's a different drummer because you're so relaxed, you know, just like on the beat or even maybe a little behind it. Accents on the high hat are beautiful. And where are you when the sun goes down? You're so far away from me. You're so far away from me. You're so far I just can't see. You're so far away from me. You're so far. As you get to the fade, I know on that record, Brothers in Arms, you you are called in um, to replace Terry Williams' tracks, right? Basically, you were. Yeah, yeah, I was. To do that. That's right. Yeah. And and were you were you given pretty much like 
did you listen to what he played and did they ask you to play something similar or did you, did they give you kind of free reign to go, you know? No, do, I, do I did get some, I did get some free reign. That was an interesting session because the engineer uh, was a friend of mine from the Power Station Studios, a guy named Neil Dorfsman. Mm-hmm. And Neil and I had been doing quite a few sessions together at Power Station. In fact, I pulled Neil in on the recording of Weather Report's Procession album. Did a great job on that record, but you know, made a lot of records with Neil. So Neil, they were in Montserrat at Air Studios. Um, right. Something happened. The drummer had to get sent back to to London, and and Neil calls and says, uh, like at two, and I get a call at like two in the morning. Can you, in New York? Can you come? to Montserrat tomorrow. <laughs> and I had heard about Montserrat only because I knew that's where uh, the police did all of their records. Yeah. I was familiar with the with the Island studio that the Beatles producer George Martin owned. It was like, wow, this sounds like an incredible place. And I also knew that uh, Luther Vandross recorded a record there, that uh, really beautiful record. One of, one of my favorites of his. So I was like, you know, have an opportunity to work there uh was going to be fun so um when i got there uh it was just me and neil the bass player and mark knopfler and um yeah basically a lot of the tracking was just guitar and drums Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know Uh, because his feel he has a very uh specific feel yeah when guitar rhythm guitar it's a very so it's funny on this on that song, it's it's once again I'm trying to not be in his way, but I'm trying to move things along. Yeah. Without, you know, because I'm because really rhythmically he's leading the feel of of the record. It's you know like even Money for Nothing is a very specific guitar mm-hmm. riff. You know what I mean? And yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. And, and and you don't need the drummer to clutter up. What Mark Knopfler does naturally, you know, I need I need to dance in and out of that. Yeah, even it's yep. funny. Even the first verse, uh, going into that first verse, I noticed instead of playing a fill, it was just a hi hat going. Psh, psh, yeah, and and then it goes into because I was like, all right, well, you know, I got to stay <laughs> out of the way. <laughs> you know, here comes the verse. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and it's funny little things it's like perfect. that, and I like the. The, you know, you're seeing out the way, but then there's the humor of it a little bit. There's a lot of little things that I'm looking for that, you know, that like I always say, I'm, I keep saying this, move the record along. It moves the record along in a way that's that's tasty. It's not it's not, uh, you know, pulling us out of the, the groove or out of this flow that's happening. You know what I mean? So Mark was really special because his his style of playing rhythm guitar is is uniquely his. Nobody plays like that. Yeah. You know, so it's really about going in and framing his thing, you know? Yeah. He, it, uh, and and was it through that record that Sting d- kind of discovered you? Is that how the connection with him singing on Money for Nothing? And Oh, it's even deeper than that. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, the day that we cut Money for Nothing... Sting was on the island on holiday with his wife, Trudy. And they came by the studio that night for dinner. So I was doing something with the drums and then I came out and they were already sitting at the, this kind of long dinner table. Mm. And, um, and I'm at the other end and, I, and they're talking about Sting leaving the police and you know starting a new solo record so my ears perk up and i told the story many times i'm sure people have heard it before but uh he starts saying uh how he's in new york and he's been talking to branford marsalis and he's got a call in to daryl jones branford's bringing kenny kirkland and i'm like well <laughs> my you know these are all my buddies here so my pal. <laughs> i i go down the table i go uh well you found your drummer <laughs> they were all my friends right i'm going you found your drummer and so and they look at me like you know and and uh and then mark mark says oh i forgot to introduce you guys sting meet omar omar meet sting 
And Sting looks at me and he goes, you're Omar Hakim? And I, get, I said, yeah. He said, my manager is in New York looking for you right now. <laughs> Isn't that oh, weird? I, I've never heard this story. That is oh, so... Maybe maybe you've told me I that's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I, and then I and then of course the punchline is that is a example of what we call synchronicity. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to know what what that word means, <laughs> that's an example of it right there. <laughs> oh man, oh that's and, and so how so it was fairly soon after that you started recording with him right i mean it was yeah so basically what happened was um uh he told me about it then he goes in they then they cut his vocal on money for nothing yeah um then he, and then he says um you know in a couple of weeks when you get home let, call me gave me his number call me we'll get together so when we get together the first time at sir studios in new york that that day that we got together was the day the band showed up oh Okay. Well, he had already been listening to a bunch of people, but that day the band converged on that room. Kenny, Branford, Daryl, and me, and Sting. And it felt like from the moment we played together, it was a thing. Mm -hmm. Like right away, it felt amazing. And uh, and then we rehearsed for about a week, and then Sting's management set up uh, what they call a secret gig you know, unannounced, which means that, you know, for Sting, there'll be a line three times around the block to get in. <laughs> yeah. It was a small club um, in the in Greenwich Village where we played the music for the Dream of the Blue Turtles record live for the first time before we recorded the record. No kidding. I have a cassette of that somewhere of that gig. I got to find it. Wow. Uh, so all funny. those songs were written before you went in the studio. You guys, oh, everything was yeah all done yeah he had them even when he was auditioning the man he had all the, the songs were done i believe got it okay and we okay. we played those songs at that gig forgot the name of the venue um and uh and i think we played two nights at that place but it, but it was really cool because it gave us a chance to work out things in front of an audience it's good to play music sometimes in front of an audience like that sure and yeah. then from there we flew to Barbados to track the album. The album was tracked in March of 85 at Eddie Grant's studio in Barbados. Remember Eddie Grant? Electric Avenue, yeah. We're gonna rock on to yeah. the Electric Avenue. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Great studio, man. It was okay. like a, a giant sugarcane farm. And in the barn, uh, was this state-of-the-art recording studio. I mean, Electric Avenue was such a big hit. He had everything in this barn, a, a crazy SSL console, steward of tape machines, the, you know, racks and racks of incredible analog outboard gear. I mean, it was it was a really incredible space That's, to work in. Wow, yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and it's funny because I remember kind of in the morning riding around the, the farm on his tractor with him and he was teaching me how to cut, uh, you know, the, the canes and sugar stuff. Cane, on the sugar yeah. Cane. He was the trip, man. We, we So these are fun memories. And then also going to the, the beaches. Uh, we would, ba Sting would want to be in the water while the sun was up. You know, he's a great swimmer. So that, so we would, so the sessions wouldn't start until late, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun, man. So we took about, I'm going to say the record was tracked in a week, maybe two weeks. I, I don't remember being, I don't remember me being there that long. Maybe I did all of my tracks in a week and then um, they stayed and finished up. Um, and then from there, uh, we, that was March, April, May, we flew to Paris and did the movie Bring on the Night. And then um, June, July, we had time off. Daryl Jones and I did a record with John Schofield called Still Warm during that time. Yeah, my friend Mike uh, Powers, who's who's watching, uh, great drummer, great singer, had mentioned that. And I think he just he put a comment up while we're while we've been chatting, just saying, you know, amazing record. I, yeah, oh yeah, Still Warm. Yeah, uh, Omar's drumming is so grooving. Yeah. 
Thanks. Yeah, we had a lot of fun, and it was they and uh, you know Schofield wrote some incredible stuff for that record. Um, and then um, in August we took off for Japan, first gig, first official gig of the tour. Now, now by now the album's out. Everything happened really fast. The album's out. The single um, uh, set them free. If you love yeah. somebody, three was a was a number one record and huge. Yeah. Um, the, the the video was playing on MTV, and then the first gig is like Tokyo, forty thousand people opening for Foreigner. Uh, it was a it was a re- what a, what a ride, man! And so that tour went from August eighty five to like April eighty six. Man, yeah, it was yeah, a fantastic experience. That's a great ride. Man, and and it's just, I mean, you know, we could keep going. We there's, I, I think we're going to have to do a follow up <laughs> episode to this because we're we're only in the '80s right now, and and I've I've kept you here a while. And I also wanted to mention, I didn't mention this before, but I do a separate um, podcast show called Track Talk, where oh. I just I did one the other day with Stan Lynch, and we talked oh. about a Tom Petty stop dragging my heart around. I'm going to have Steve Gadd on Monday, talk about oh, Asia. Yeah. So I would love to have you come back on a separate track talk and we, we can pick any one of these 10,000 <laughs> songs that you played on and, right. and really do a deep dive. But, um, but Oh man, that sounds, that sounds like fun. You know, it's interesting too, that you're, you're focusing on like a lot of the kind of the rock records that I've made. And it's interesting because I've been in the studio for the last couple of months working on a solo project. And this time, I decided to focus on my rock influences. And I've, I've never, I like, I've, I'm always helping other people make rock records. And when I do my solo records, they're kind of a, a blend of, mm-hmm. of fusion and pop and funk or whatever. But I was like, you know, this time, I think I'm gonna just go back to my rock roots and just have some fun. So I'm eight songs into a 10 song album right now. Uh, I'm calling the album, Come Out to Play. I even dusted off my guitars. I got Vernon Reed to help me on a track. Uh, oh, my longtime yeah. bass player, Jerry Brooks, is playing uh, playing bass with me. But most of the stuff is me playing guitar and keys and singing. And so this, I can't wait to share this because this is this is kind of a fun project for me and a fun statement. And yeah, and I'm probably going to go out and, and tour it this time. You know. Great. And, take it out to the, to my friends out there and maybe we can have some fun together on the road, you know? Absolutely. Any idea when this, do you think sometime this year you'll have it ready? Oh yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely trying to release um, by the end of summer, you know, like August, September, my manager slowing me down. Cause she's like, do not put this record out yourself. She said, she went, <laughs> she's like, you, need, you need support on this one. And I'm like, you know, I was like, okay, let's do that. Let's get, you know, we have yeah. a lot of friends at the labels. Let's see if we can, get them to help us on this one with the marketing and everything. And yeah. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing it, man. That's exciting. Well, I'd, I'd love it if you came, you know, and did another one of these too, to help get it out there to drummers too. We could do it. Oh, I would love to, man. Yeah. yeah. We could just focus on the record. We could play some songs and absolutely. Cool. Um, Pat Mestolato. Oh, Pat. Yeah. Pat's watching. And he says, uh, Hey, yeah. Right. Oh man, he is such yeah. a badass, isn't he? He sure is. Yeah, I'm going to be oh, getting man. Pat on here. Yeah, I got to get Pat on here. Yeah, overdue. Yep. Um, but Omar, I've, I've, I've so appreciate all your time today. You've been so generous with it. I told you to be about an hour, and we're working on two. And all good. I really, My this pleasure. is, this has been a blast. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's, it's. I been, certainly have enjoyed it, and I, and I'm happy to know that so many of my friends and colleagues are watching too. You know, our, you know, our drumming community is really beautiful, man, because, you know, guitar players don't, don't have this kind of community in the same way that drummers do or keyboard play, uh, keyboard players or any other instrument, man, you know, and, and it, it's incredible how the drummers all come out and support each other. And I, and I, and, and I have a theory about the reason for that. I think that the reason is, is because we all know what each other has to go through to play this instrument. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And it's like we're bonded. Dude, you, yeah. you know, you, you I understand. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. You know There's what I mean? Something to that. Yeah, there really and, is. And I really, I really do believe that 
because of the, you know the nature of the instrument, the fact that you know in many cultures it is the communication device, you know, um, yeah, and and, it, and, it, and it's and it's a huge part of language and 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 rhythm moves the heart and soul of people all around the world. I mean, music is the is the one thing that everybody in the world agrees on. We might not agree on politics or religion or you know whatever, but but we agree all agree on music. Yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah. And and that and that is the the beauty and the power of of music and being a musician and having the um, the privilege to to share and uh, and contribute to this world. You know, absolutely. Well said. And you know, I was going to say, as drummers too, I think we can all relate and commiserate to you know the the band leader or the songwriter or the producer telling you it's too fast or it's too slow or you know. I want the tempo, you know, you know what I mean? And we can all, we all kind of share that same. Oh yeah, bond man. Of like, yeah, we <laughs> in the trenches, you know? No, it's a beautiful thing. And, and, and it's, and, and what's also fun about drummers is, you know, it's the, 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 the style and the way the, uh, that drummers play rhythms or feel rhythms is as unique as your fingerprint. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's because, you know, five guys will sit down and play a, a simple funk group or a simple rock group, but they'll have a they'll have their own swing that it's hard for another guy to replicate that because it is their fingerprint. Like I said, it's their yeah. You know what I mean? And that I love hearing that, and I recognize that, and it and it, and it's fun to 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 observe in many ways. You know, yeah. absolutely. Well, Omar, thank you so much for being here today, and I. I Everybody, please give Omar a big hand, the great Omar Hakim. And uh, if you'll hang with me for one second, we'll uh, sure, end, the, sure. end the broadcast, and then um, I'll see you in the room there. But okay, thanks man. for watching, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Yes, indeed. <laughs>